Hi, my name is Andrea Kirkwood. I'm a professor here at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. And it's my pleasure to talk to you today about the research that we do in my lab. Uh, as you can see here, I uh, focus on aquatic ecology in my lab and the applied aspects of aquatic ecology, which includes algal biotechnology. So fundamentally, even though I'm an, a microbial ecologist, so I study the small things that live in, in lakes and ponds and wetlands, I really am interested in aquatic ecosystem health. How do the processes of these microbial communities influence the health of an entire aquatic ecosystem? So today I'm going to be talking to you about the research that we've done uh, in the land between Ecotone, as well as uh, research we've done in stormwater management ponds in Durham region. I also uh, do invasive species biology in my lab. Uh, I have some expertise in uh, Dinymosphenia geminata, say that fast three times, uh, also known as rock snot. Uh, it's a problematic alga that uh, is invading uh, aquatic systems around the world, particularly clean river systems, as well as uh, biotechnology. So taking what we know about how uh, algae grow in the environment and how they can tolerate very harsh conditions, uh, we apply that to both bioremediation and biofuel um, applications. So the first uh, research project I'm going to be talking to you about uh, looks at the influence of shoreline development uh, in lakes of the land between Ecotone, focusing on water quality uh, and shoreline development. So this is a map of southern Ontario, particularly south central Ontario. And you can see Oshawa is around here. But when you overlay it with uh, a geology uh, or parent material map that um, I received uh, from the Ontario Geological Survey, you can see that there's a really noticeable line here that kind of bisects southern Ontario from uh, central and, and northern Ontario. And what's really interesting is that there's a whole area here of different parent material that underlays the soil and the lakes and wetlands. Uh, and uh, that underlying geology is really important in, in basically the structure of ecosystems in this region. And so this, this area here where you see a transition from one geological type to another forms the foundation of the land between ecotone. So when you overlay it with uh, a much more simplistic map, you can see that from an ecological perspective, the transition zone is fairly broad uh, across uh, from Georgian Bay over here to roughly Kingston over here. Uh, and for those of you from Ontario, you'll recognize that this band is also known as cottage country. So the Kawarthas, Muskoka, Halliburton, uh, which is in this kind of secondary um, transition zone here, are all situated in the land between. So it's very fundamentally an important uh, geographical area for uh, rec recreation, uh, as well as um, biodiversity. So why do we uh, want to have a better understanding of aquatic ecosystem health in the land between? You know, you think by now with, you know, over um, half a century of aquatic research, we know everything there is to know about lakes. Um, and, and certainly in the land between, in cottage country, there have been studies to look at problem-based uh, issues, such as uh, lake acidification. So back in the 1980s, um, there were, uh, and, and 70s as well, there were problems with lakes being acidified because of all of the fossil fuels that were being burned uh, in the Ohio Valley in, in the states, particularly from coal burning. Uh, all of that, uh, uh, those particulates, which acidified precipitation, was being deposited in Ontario and in eastern Canada. So we have uh, a better understanding of lake acidification um, by studying lakes in the land between, eutrophication, which is really the um, uh, excess of nutrients that are being added to an aquatic system, causing it to look like this. 
So for those of you who are familiar with the Experimental Lakes area, uh, fundamental research has been done in the Experimental Lakes area, and this is a very famous photo. And in this photo you can see this berm that separates two basins of Lake uh, 227. In one basin, they just added um, nitrogen uh, and silica, I believe, as a nutrient source. But in this basin, they added nitrogen plus phosphorus. And they were able to determine that in most lakes, particularly in Ontario, the limiting nutrient is phosphorus. And so when you have too much phosphorus going into a lake, it becomes pea soup green and um, too much algae are growing, which can cause a lot of problems in ecosystem health. Also, mercury pollution. Uh, during my master's, when I was a graduate student, uh, I did uh, studies on phytoplankton uh, uptake of mercury um, uh, in two lakes in the land between. So we've targeted specific problems to better understand uh, how lakes respond to these env environmental uh, uh, impacts. But unlike terrestrial studies of plant and bird species in the land between, we actually don't have a cohesive understanding. We have a patchwork quilt of different lakes that have been studied, but because of the um, huge gradients in pH, alkalinity, and other environmental parameters because of the underlying geological mosaic, we really don't know how these problems and their impacts change along the environmental gradients that are evident in the land between. So fundamentally, my research program is interested in looking at aquatic diversity and function in the land between and how they change uh, along um, environmental gradients. So lakes, especially small lakes, uh, are important to study, not only because they're easier to take a canoe out into the middle and, and take samples compared to, say, Lake Ontario, um, but they're actually more uh, greatly influenced by their surrounding watershed. Uh, the Great Lakes, because of the dilution power, um, certainly are impacted by their watersheds, but when you compare the relative sizes of the watersheds, smaller lakes generally are more greatly impacted. Uh, and these impacts include the local geology, so if you have granite versus limestone, that's going to influence your lake chemistry. The edaphic characteristics, which are simply is a fancy way of soil and plant communities, uh, they um, are very important in the water quality characteristics, so for those of you who are familiar with going up to cottage country, you'll note that some lakes are clear and other lakes um, have kind of a tea-stained nature to them, so they have a little bit of a brownish, brownish tinge, uh, and that is due to the edaphic characteristics of the surrounding watershed. The brownish tinge is really breakdown products from decaying leaves and pine needles that are washing off the landscape into the lake. Certainly wetlands uh, are, have an important uh, influence on small lakes because they're bringing in water and uh, breakdown products from decomposition and land use. So if you recall, uh, the land between is an important region for recreation and there's many uh, cottages, therefore shoreline development on many lakes in the land between. So the type of land use, whether there's lots of construction activities, whether there's lots of septic systems or a sewage treatment plant, these are all types of different human uses on the landscape that will eventually impact surrounding lakes. So small lakes really serve as an important um, sentinel or canary uh, in the coal mine of the impacts that we are doing on a landscape such as the land between which already has um, a, a variety of environmental gradients we're actually adding to these uh, gradients through our own activities. And so by studying the small lakes we can get a better gauge of how these lakes are doing on the landscape uh, with human impact. Okay, so the study I'll be talking about today uh, was focused on characterizing the water quality uh, in a subset of lakes that we've looked at in the land between. Uh, and these lakes were picked based on uh, an attempt to get gradients. So gradients meaning differences or changes uh, along a scale of pH, uh, hot wa water hardness, nutrients, um, and shoreline development. And what I mean by shoreline de development is basically how many cottages uh, or buildings um, were uh, along the shoreline of the lakes in our study. As, as it's basically representing um, uh, human activities or land use activities. Okay, the second uh, 
objective of our study was to assess the algal biomass. So if we recall from that picture from Lake 227, it had uh, a lot of algae growing when phosphorus was uh, high. And so uh, typically we compare water quality, so including nutrients here, with algal biomass to see if there are relationships that exist in the land between lakes. And finally, because we're examining the algal community, we look for particular species uh, or taxa that are represented in the community that can give us an indication of how healthy uh, the lakes are. And so later on in the talk, I'll be uh, showing you some examples of particular species that showed up in our analyses that give us an indication of the uh, aquatic health status of each lake. Okay, so the study design was fairly uh, simple. We had six lakes depicted here by the red dots. And we had uh, basically divided them up into two hardness categories. So we have the hard water lakes up here and the soft water lakes down here. And we tried to get representative lakes from different uh, representations of shoreline development. So these lakes here had very little shoreline development, so very few cottages, whereas lakes at the other end of the gradient had uh, the most number of cottages, so fairly well-developed shorelines. Okay, so here's a Google map uh, showing where exactly these lakes are in the land between. So the hard water lakes are down here, and so they more or less follow a, a latitudinal um, gradient or horizontal gradient. And here you can see uh, as we go north in the land between, we, we shift from a limestone-dominated uh, uh, landscape to one that is granite dominated and granite uh, uh, really is um, lacks a lot of ions and so forth and so um, it helps to contribute to a soft water uh, lakes compared to limestone which um, provides a lot of the ions necessary for hard water and the hard water lakes. Okay so just to show you we had 58 cottages in our, our uh, lake that had the highest amount of shoreline development in the softwater lakes. Uh, 30 cottages was the intermediate shoreline development and two cottages was our uh, representative low shoreline development. And conversely, we had 68 cottages in um, uh, one of our hard water lakes, 38 cottages in the trailer park for intermediate and one uh, trailer park, uh, just at one part of the lake uh, for our, our low uh, shoreline development lake. So what kinds of predictions do we have on the outset? You, normally when you have a study uh, as part of your um, study to design, you basically have an idea, well, what, are, what is it that you're trying to test or determine? And so from the outset, we, we thought that, well, we know that uh, limestone versus granite um, can actually have uh, different impacts on the nutrients that are available. Uh, to uh, lakes in addition to their pH and, and water hardness. Okay, so hard water lakes were believed to have a higher shoreline development intensity, um, would inherently have higher nutrients, and when you have higher shoreline development intensity, this is because the more cottages you have in a lake, the more septic systems, uh, the more erosion, um, both of which can contribute to higher nutrients entering the lake um, as runoff and as leaching into the lake. Uh, but also the limestone itself, the parent material, uh, tends to have more phosphorus in it than uh, granite would. Um, but later on we'll see that this is actually not necessarily true. The type of limestone that exists in southern Ontario really d uh, doesn't have a lot of phosphorus naturally in it. Uh, land use, of course, is going to be important as I just talked about. And these, in conjunction, would cause higher algal biomass because you'd expect if you have higher phosphorus or higher nutrients, um, the algae would respond to that nutrients and, and uh, be in, in higher abundance, um, as well as variable community structure. So really, it's difficult to predict the, the community stu structure, but you'd expect if there was uh, high nutrients in particular lakes, regardless of being hard water or soft water, um, that uh, they would have different uh, community structures because we know that algae can be sensitive to pH and therefore in the more soft water lakes you'd expect different algae than the hard water lakes. Okay, so this is a table full of numbers and really 
All I'm uh, attempting to do here is show you trends. So there's no uh, expectation for you to, to look at each individual number. You'll note that I've divided or grouped the lakes up into soft water and hard water. And you'll note that I've ordered them from low to high shoreline development intensity. Now the second depth is really a reflection or trying to represent the clarity, water clarity. And this is basically a proxy for how much light is available for algal growth. And what we can see is that generally speaking, the soft water lakes have a uh, more shallower or shorter secchi depth than the limestone lakes. Uh, now, when it comes to phosphorus, there really wasn't much of a difference between uh, either groups of lakes, which was, vi was inter very interesting to us uh, based on what I just talked about with our ex expectations on the differences between hard water and soft water. Inorganic nitrogen uh, was non-detectable. So this means that these lakes are potentially nitrogen limited. And when we look at organic nitrogen, which can be utilized um, by algae as well, uh, there weren't really any huge noticeable differences between our groups of lakes. So when it comes to nutrients, there really wasn't a lot of differences, which is rather surprising. However, when it comes to chlorophyll A, we did see some relationships with water quality variables, which I'll show you graphically. So here we can see in the soft water lakes, which are here, and the hard water lakes over here, going along the direction of shoreline development, you can see that as chlorophyll increases, so chlorophyll represent is represented by the green bars, uh, you have a general pattern of increasing phosphorus. And this means makes sense because we know that typically algae are limited by the amount of phosphorus available in lakes, and so therefore we're not surprised to see a corresponding uh, correlation with phos phosphorus. But even though this trend is evident, it really wasn't statistically significant um, when looking at the direct relationship between phosphorus uh, and chlorophyll. So in order to test uh, valid or statistical relationships between the water quality variables and the amount of uh, algae based on chlorophyll A, we looked at all of our water quality parameters and we found that these were the most important independent predictors of algal biomass. So in a multiple reg regression, when you put in your independent variables such as shoreline development, secchi depth, and total phosphorus, they have an additive effect on the model that we can actually explain 76% of the variation in algal biomass. So this indicates that indeed shoreline development uh, index, uh, which is basically the representing the amount of shoreline development, uh, secchi depth and uh, phosphorus, so light availability and nutrient availability are all important uh, in um, explaining the amounts of algae in these lakes. However, when you're looking at the composition of algae, so this is just a graphic, so you don't have to know the individual um, algal group names. That's really not what's important. What's important is to focus on the patterns you see with the colors. And I'm hoping what you'll see is that there really are no patterns, that every lake has unique community structure. And this was actually kind of surprising to me because uh, the hard water lakes I would have expected to have more or less similar community structures and the soft water lakes to have more or less similar community structures. And yet they're all different. All samples were collected at the same time, or sorry, the same day. Uh, and so um, there was, there's no kind of seasonal differences um, that we found here. And so what the interpretation I have from these data is that, you know, there's still a lot we have to know and understand about the community structure of algae. Yes, we, we may be able to understand total biomass, but when it comes to the different groups that contribute to the functioning um, of the, uh, these, the, the lake communities, well there's still uh, quite a bit we need to um, study and understand. So this graph here um, looks a little bit complicated, but it's a canonical correspondence uh, analysis graph, and I, I tried to make it as large as possible so it doesn't have a title, so I apologize for that. But I will point out to you that in canonical correspondence, we're actually looking for drivers of uh, community structure uh, based on um, lake as well as uh, the water quality variables we studied. 
So up here we can see that the hard water lakes generally group together, much less uh, kind of tight fitting of the soft water lakes, but certainly there's a, a quite a distinct uh, degree of difference between the hard water and soft water, which is what I was hoping to see. Um, what we're finding here is that hardness, conductivity, and, and secu depth are very important in driving uh, certain algal groups, uh, and here it's actual genera of, of algae in these lakes, uh, Cryptomonas and, and Ephenicapsa. Uh, microcystis, which I'll talk about in the next few slides, um, seems to be uh, driven by, uh, you know, typically found in higher pH waters. Whereas Anabina, which I'll talk about with microcystis, tends to be found in soft water lakes. Uh, and so uh, these are two taxa of blue-green algae that have important ramifications for ecosystem health. Okay, so as I mentioned before, Anabina seem to be really an important uh, taxa a taxon in uh, soft water lakes. And, and why are we concerned about anabina? Well, when anabina shows up in any number, uh, particularly if it has heterocysts, these specialized cells here, larger cells that show up under the microscope, we know that the lake is likely nitrogen limited because anabina have a very unique physiology, just like other um, certain types of blue-green algae, and that they can fix nitrogen. They can take gaseous nitrogen, so that originates from the atmosphere, uh, and convert it into uh, nitrate um, for growth. And so when anabina tends to be found, that gives us a, a, a red flag that, oh, there's nitrogen limitation here. And we found that anabina was typically found in soft water lakes more so than the hard water lakes, which I was a little bit surprised at, um, but certainly suggests that uh, anabina probably doesn't do as well in the hard water lakes. So anabina is an, a bioindicator of, of nitrogen limitation. Now microcystis, which looks like this kind of green blob here, um, is a bit of a concern because microcystis is known that it can uh, produce toxins. And all lakes in our study were actually positive for microcystis, at least based on taxonomic identification. Um, so further tests would be required to determine if, if um, microcystis was indeed a toxin producer. But uh, we found that microcystis um, was very dominant in, in all of the lakes, and this is probably related to the very hot summer we had in, in 2010. Uh, and microcystis is known for doing really well in, in, um, in warmer waters. So when looking at um, if there is a propensity for anabina to be in soft water lakes compared to hard water lakes, we had a relatively small sample size, but using non-parametric techniques, we were able to show that statistically uh, there's, there tends to be the presence of anabina uh, would happen more, um, there's a higher probability of anabina happening in the soft water lakes than in the hard water lakes. Now with respect to microcystis, because it showed up in all of our lakes, uh, it appears to be uh, phosphorus limited, sorry. So here we can see that phosphorus measured in the lakes can explain 41% of the variation in microcystis biomass, which for environmental data is, is a pretty significant uh, relationship. And so the concern is, is that if these lakes were to increase in phosphorus through shoreline development uh, activities, so the addition of more phosphorus, that we could be getting more microcystis in the future, particularly with global climate change and the expectation that we're going to be getting warmer and warmer summers. Okay, so regardless of lake type, we found that all lakes were generally similar, which was kind of surprising. Uh, when you think of lakes, when they're treated as soft water or hard, hard water, uh, they're, they're always kind of grouped separately, and yet we found more similarities than differences. Another commonality between them is that regardless of lake type, high shoreline development seemed to correspond with higher algal biomass. So that is an indication, and it's confirming other uh, studies, that shoreline development certainly um, does seem to be a factor in promoting uh, algal growth. Now algal diversity, so diversity meaning the numbers uh, and abundance of different species in the lakes, was unique to each lake. So it was very difficult for us to find any patterns based on the water quality parameters we measured. 
uh, but certainly diversity was lowest uh, at the lowest nutrient levels. So these lakes are in a state um, where when you, you add a little bit more nutrients to them, it seems to increase algal diversity. Now the presence of certain cyanob cyanobacterial or blue-green algae uh, species raises concerns, um, particularly for, well, anabina and microcystis are both known to bloom and be op opportunistic when growth conditions are conducive to those species. And particularly we should be concerned about toxin production um, because microcystis is very problematic in other aquatic systems. 